What's going on everybody? Super Tuesday. Hey, hello, welcome. So we're gonna dive into this. Now I wanna first start by walking you through the progression. Uh, we did an initial styling of a linden while it was still very much in its nursery container long, long ago. That tree is making in incredible progress right now in the hands of very talented Mariah student, Adam Johnson. And this was one of the three that came from that batch that we had already potted. And we potted it up without having done big, huge, major branch decisions. We came back April of 2020, and Josh Sales has queued up a little piece for you here just to show you the original condition of this tree in the current container. We made big branching decisions. We eliminated a lot of prominent structural pieces. Uh, and we just simply ended that stream on the pruning process. We allowed this to grow all the way through 2020. We came back in the fall. This exact time in terms of the leaf drop in the fall, coming back to the big styling. And this is where we made the next step of structural setting. And here you see the, the tree with the elongation over the growth period. And by the end of this stream, we are setting primary pieces into the positions where we needed them to be to have that progression occur. So now coming back into the studio with that, you can see, oh my goodness, this has added a lot. Every single year we construct a little bit more. How was this tree handled this year? It was allowed to flush out, no pinching in terms of our lindens. Once it flushed out, hardened off, partial defoliated, we got a small second flush. Typically in a normal year, we would get a bigger flush. I think the heat to some degree really did, you know, and typically you see warmer years expedite and enhance the amount of vigor. But we went from that reasonable amount of heat to that really intense heat. And that kind of shut things down. And this linden really did sort of just sit and kind of stay where it was at, had a little bit of a second push, but for the most part, we existed for the rest of the year on leaves that were much, much smaller. And even when you look into the upper canopy here, you'll notice that these leaves have been trimmed down in that partial defoliation we, we talk about. We prune it back to two, and then we cut the leaf mass down by two thirds. And you just see that two third remaining. Let's go ahead and compare that to a full size leaf on a branch that's in development. Yeah, very beautiful there. Right, let me see. So now you see how we're getting that two third reduction of the full size leaf. That's what we cut it down to. These pieces that we left these big leaves on, we can really see that these have progressed. They've thickened up, they've given us length, they've allowed us to maybe make some decisions that can improve this transition here. And these are all the things that we want to take advantage of, right? Now, as this process has continued to occur, and we recognize, and I'm just gonna take these off the tree so that they're not so distracting now that we recognize and see kind of what's transpired. Okay, but the enhancement of the number of secondary branches coming off of those structural pieces, the biggest addition from where we were at at the beginning, or excuse me, at the end of 2020 when we did the structural styling to where we're at now. And we recognize that there's a few things as this tree progresses that we have the ability to kind of maximize and continue to enhance. And so one of the things that I notice as I'm just looking at the camera is I notice that these two branches, and let me just show you those from the side, these two branches, exist on a very similar plane. Okay, I noticed that the back side of this root mass is slightly elevated above the pot. I noticed that the front side is relatively low in the container and I have some nabari that's being buried. And so I wonder, can I get a little bit of negative space underneath here? And this is really where, as trees begin to develop, we start to recognize and see things that we could not see in the original planting and the original potting of the tree. And I think this also enhances the visibility of the curvature in this trunk. It was looking a little bit straight. We tilt that up. We see that negative space there. We start to see more of this presentation. It pulls the apical region back. Notice the forward orientation here. We pull that back with that slight angle change. Up to this point, could we have predicted that was a move? Yeah, maybe. Were we ready to make that change in angle, that fine nuance adjustment? No, where are we at now? A further degree of evolution, a further degree of refinement. And these are the things that we start to tease out. This has only ever been put in this pot one time. The roots have only been worked one time. So we recognize the roots are gonna be worked further, the angle is gonna be further refined, the branching is gonna further enhance, the wounds are gonna further heal. Like we are in the middle, literally right smack dab in the middle, secondary working. We did the initial cutback, the initial potting, the structural styling. Now we're a year later at this secondary working where we really get to start to expand and what we see is that building process. Inside of that building process, 
One of the big points of this tree, and go ahead and bring me in tight here to this really troubling stump, we recognize, hey, if we cut back a high water mobility deciduous tree too quickly and we don't have this collar established, that we can get dieback all the way down that piece. Well, look at what's continued to form here. We have this diagonal collar right here where there's a swelling that has continued to delineate itself and we're finally at a moment where we can go ahead and make this cut. And this is where I want to begin the work tonight because this is going to lead to a very dramatic transition in taper and line and movement in this piece of material. And we've been waiting since the spring of 2020 when we did the initial branch cutback for that to be able to form the kind of swollen color and compartmentalized tissue that will allow us to make this cut. Okay, so I'm gonna begin here. Now I'm not gonna work the wound and I'm not gonna go through and I'm not gonna work all of the other wounds back on the stream tonight, but I will tell you that this will go into the workshop after the stream this evening and we will come back and we will work these wounds, take them down with a gouge, clean up the edges with a razor blade, patch them with a putty, and then that is how we will finish the season in terms of those wounds after the initial styling structure, et cetera, is done over the course of our time together tonight. Okay, but I'm gonna begin here just talking through sort of the angle of the cut and maximizing the preservation of that shoulder to begin the process. And then I'm gonna start working from the ground up in terms of structural and then come back and work from the ground up in terms of secondary to further extend the process and the, and the pro progress that we've made on the structural and then enhance it with those secondary branches, okay? So let me see if I can just kind of identify that swollen shoulder. Now, when we cut back to a shoulder that we've had to work so hard to earn, one of the biggest mistakes that a lot of uh, people make in this process is they cut too deep into the shoulder and they actually cut past the shoulder we've been waiting for, okay? Now, this is a three-dimensional model here, so I'm looking at all sides and just getting a line on where that saw blade is going to be coming through this tissue, where it's going to be exiting the tissue. Obviously, I don't want to exit the tissue uh, too hard or with too much force because I can blow out that opposite side and cause a lot of problems. And some of you might be saying, well, if you're going to come back with a gouge, why does it matter so much? It matters because you don't want to lean on the gouge to make the correct angle and to make the correct decision, okay? So I'm just kind of looking here and trying to get calibrated in terms of the angle that's gonna get me through this progression of shoulder tissue and end up at the point where I already have a compartmentalized cut and already I just have a slight, just a slight change that I need to make in that angle. Let me see if I can make it here. Yeah, there we go. Okay, now you see me oscillating back and forth. When we work with Japanese saws, which again, I do prefer Japanese saws, they cut on the pole, right? But I, I'm also, when I have a wound this big and I'm using this long of a flat face on your saw, right? If you cut here, you create a point in terms of a triangular form. So if I cut at this angle here, as long as my saw blade is lined up, I flatten out. That cut flattens out. And when that cut flattens out and it's spanning, one singular line of width, I have to move my saw a lot more to make incremental progress. But if I'm cutting on that concise line, now I can go ahead and I can cut at a different angle and I start to take advantage of the corners of those cuts. I flatten here, I turn my saw, I cut, I flatten here. I turn my saw, I cut, I flatten here, and I make more progress incre incrementally in the cut of this and the removal of these bigger pieces, okay? So if you see me just sort of oscillating, it's to make sure that my saw is continuing to progress across that to the maximum degree that I can while also continuing to make sure and reference whether or not I'm getting into those areas and maintaining that shoulder intact. And the back side looks really good, front side looks really good. Got her lined up, I had to correct there. And just in the beginning of that, first three, four, five saw draws, as you start to enter that blade, you can see where you're gonna have problems, where you're gonna have to make adjustments. We had to make that initial adjustment, it was a good adjustment, right? Because now we're gonna be coming out right on that shoulder, okay? Little bit of pressure. This tree is very, very wet. It's been outside in the rain, and so you start to feel the wood bind. You get that heat kind of working on that tissue inside of there. Things start to expand, sawdust starts to clog up. There's a lot of moisture because we understand at this point in time, 
That reabsorption of pigmentation, that's what leads from the green to the coloration of the fall. We see the carotenoids left behind. Okay, all that stuff is happening right now. And it does make, and I want to be very, very careful to not get too aggressive with this as I'm working through it, but it does make the cut a little bit more challenging because of that saturated wood and that moisture content and all of those things kind of binding up as we have the heat of the saw, the friction of the cut, working through that wood, okay? This is supposed to be easier to start the stream. <laughs> I'm planning on working this hard. There we go. Good. Okay, now we're through it, that tough spot. Okay, now watch how I back off here, right? Because now that I've kind of gotten through the tough spot, I'm really gonna kind of, and you can hear the, the, the change in the tone of the saw, right? I'm going much, much, much lighter on my pressure. I'm going much, much, much shallower on my poles because I don't want to and tear this off and decimate that shoulder, right? So I'm just kind of working through some of these pieces. And now I'm gonna come here and I'm just gonna support. Okay, I'm not pushing down but I'm not letting it tear. Just supporting, and I come off that side. Oh, that is, a, that, is a, that is a significant shift. Oh, look at that, in the trunk shape. That's something that we've waited, that we've earned, that we've deserved. Getting that edge off, building that shoulder, such a monumental part of the process by which we form that collar and that compartmentalization capacity and avoid that dieback, okay? So having that out of the way, we now get a very good, right? And if, if we were talking about what is the scope of work right now, is it a good time to work these wounds? Absolutely, absolutely. And let me show you why. When I come back and I start to look at these, we see major callus healing by this big wound where we removed a structural branch and we have a significant uh, structural branch working to improve or, or, or uh, expedite that healing process. The one next to it, what we recognize is that we have a big branch below it, but we don't have anything above it that's pulling water through it until we get up to sort of this misaligned branch in the upper apical region of the tree. Okay, so when we start to look at this, that distance right there is causing this to heal less. Now there is significant callus formation, and if you zoom into this, we see on the edges of this the formation of a really beautiful kind of orangey red sliver of tissue right here on the collar. Go ahead and come all the way in here. And you can just start to, there it is. You see that? That's the addition of callus. Now it's not just there that the callus is forming, it's this entire ring right here is living tissue, but that's the only progression of the new tissue that's happening right now. When you compare it to the one next to it, just slide over there for a minute for me, yeah. When you compare that, notice how big and how healthy that ring is. These are the discussions of what happens when you have a branch conducting water immediately above a wound versus you have a significant spacing before you get to a water conduction piece and how does that ring tr through the process of healing, right? The closer we have a branch above a wound, the faster it is going to heal. Both of them will heal over the course of time, I'm not concerned, but it is a discussion of the fact that even now, as this tree is dropping leaf, this tree is still actively adding vascular tissue and trunk girth by that accumulation and, and production of vascular tissue as well as that loading of the sugar starch content. And again, when we see the leaves drop, two weeks. Two weeks is the general time frame that we have to be really allocating, compartmentalizing fresh wounds, working those pieces and adding to that callus formation prior to dormancy, et cetera. Two weeks is generally the time frame we have to work this. We're on the front side of that two weeks when we're in development, when we're in secondary. We want to be earlier as opposed to later because now we're gonna get the maximum amount of sugar starch redistribution and vascular productivity compartmentalization. When we're working in refinement, we wanna to be towards the end of that two weeks. We're waiting for the majority of the, of the leaves not just to turn color, but actually to fall off, to dry up, and to really lose any last remaining piece and then we come back in, but the amount of wounds, the size of the wounds, the reduction that we do in refinement means we're not opening up big, huge holes in the tree. These are small cuts, these are branch tips, these are secondaries at most, and we're gonna be cleaning them, treating them, 
but we're not asking for a big wound healing to occur, okay? So now that we're there, slightly off center in terms of the front, we have this negative space. I really want to be trying now to, to place these pieces that have not held their shape into important regions to occupy the space, further fill out the canopy. I wanna be making decisions on the secondaries that have evolved and developed, taking away any structural pieces that don't feel like they contribute or may have a lower degree of quality for the ultimate uh, design and shape of the tree. And I'm just looking to re-emphasize and further carry forward structural opportunities in terms of advancing those structural branching positions in the tree so that they continue to enhance the design. And there's a few places that I notice we need to further uh, improve the quality of. The first big place that we need to change the qualities right here. I wanna pull this branch further to the back. I'm probably gonna lean on a guy wire so that I can actually expose this piece away from the upper canopy and start to open that branch up. It's kind of sitting in an awkward position. It's always been an awkward branch, but it's structurally sound. And on this tree where we remove so much structure, keeping this and continuing to advance and develop that transition of taper, this is a major objective. This, tree, this piece was not shortened when we did the partial defoliation. And in fact, we utilize that leaf mass to further thicken it. Okay, the other place that I really want to improve is this vertical branch right here in the very front of the tree. We kept this piece, we transitioned to this piece, but now we have a bud here and we have a bud on this side here and we can take this very rigid piece back and start to create something that's far more attractive, a little bit shorter and more proportional, still maintaining that elevation but pulling it back off of the tip of that branch. I'm gonna start with these two pieces as major structural demands that I think are gonna enhance the design of the tree and then we will work through the rest of it as we start to see this come together, okay? I'm gonna open it up for questions as I start to apply these initial pieces and make some of these cuts and then I'm just gonna stream of conscious walk you through the work as we perform it. All right, up first I've got a question from Gary. Uh, between when leaves on a deciduous tree begin to change color and when they completely fall off, is there an optimal time to do this fall pruning just as this process starts or at any point within it? Does it vary by deciduous species? It varies by state of refinement, Gary, and I think we probably answered that uh, as we were talking, but the more developmental the work is on the tree, the, the earlier right when they're dropping, just like you saw with this, we still had leaves on the tree, okay? Once we start to get into a state of refinement, we wanna definitely be doing this later on, but, but we're making much less significant cuts, much less significant reductions, and consequently needing a much less significant callus formation and compartmentalization to occur in order to make sure that we can heal those wounds and get those set up for growth next year, okay? So we're looking at stage of development more than anything else when we're performing those wounds. Okay, here you go. Nice reduction and you notice that big, and let me just show you how coarse this piece was. Okay, we had this big tip here. Yes, it had an interesting sort of redirect, but notice how compromising, and let me show you from the side here, notice how compromisingly close to the tip of that branch that is. We take that back, and now all of a sudden we've got this beautiful little piece here that we stayed just above, okay? I'm gonna come back in and I'm gonna clean this up. I did a slight little V cut here to create a little notch. There's a little overlap that I'm gonna have to perfect there, but now I can bring this forward and I can start to build that second layer more sustainably. These are the types of moves that as we get those interior smaller branches compartmentalized shoulders, as we get secondaries showing more profound thickness and the capacity to take over the transition of taper, we come back in and continue to push, continue to refine, continue to enhance the quality of the tree. Uh, up next is Bentley. Was the blue pot selected to complement the fall leaf color? <laughs> you know, honestly, this was the only pot that this tree would fit in at the time when we potted it, and so that's where the blue pot came from. But over, over the course of this tree's evolution, the blue pot, I have to say, I'm not upset at. I think it's quite nice. And in fact, it's enhanced uh, the visual appearance of the tree pretty significantly. Um, but there wasn't a lot of design uh, acknowledgement of quality when we made the decision for the blue pot. I, I just gotta be straightforward and honest about that. I, I like the color choice. It's a, I know. It's, it's a good, it's a periwinkle blue. It meaning it has a, a little bit of purple in it, uh -huh. which really contrasts the yellow. I know, look at this. Bam. Look at that, a little yellow blue action. How, who doesn't like that? Come on now, come, come on, on. <laughs> show me that. Yes, very nice. Uh, up next is a question from Foz. Foz wants to know if you could have wedge cut above that very top shoulder that you cut to make the saw movement easier. Um, if I could have wedge cut. So I try to avoid, and, and when we start to talk about, you know, the saw cut being easier, the saw cut, 
uh, is what it is when you're dealing with, uh, especially when you're dealing with a uh, uh, enlarged or a swollen branch due to moisture content, especially after the rain we've had, pigmentation, reabsorption, more vascular tissue on the tree than it's ever had before. I'm not, I'm not super worried about that. I just want to be very technically sound as I work through it. We know there's a pinch point. We got through that pinch point, tough piece of wood. I don't know if there was uh, a point here. It looks like there's a little bit of a change in density uh, where compartmentalization has and hasn't occurred here and through the wet spot was really where it bound up. Uh, if I wedge, if I cut a wedge out of that, I'm just adding more work for myself. I don't know that the wedge would have made it any easier. Maybe it could have relieved some pressure, but ultimately I'm, I'm happy with the way that it went. I wouldn't look to try and make that easy. I just want you to understand that when you're in that binding moment, the action is to just go slow and be very, very deliberate in terms of your saw uh, action so that you make sure that you don't do something that will uh, inevitably de detriment that branch for, it, for the, uh, its duration, right? Because once we make a scar, once we have a slip, once we perform an action that really does damage the tissue of a very thin bark tree, it's tough to get rid of that uh, evidence of mistake. And we want to be sure that we don't, if we can avoid it, we don't do that. Right up next is a question from Bentley. Bentley says, transitioning the primary line of the trunk left, a big wound that needs to be addressed. How do you go about creating a trunk with taper with no big wounds or scars? A trunk with taper with no big wounds or scars. Well, I think that's a big part. And you have to decide, Bentley, what is your value system for the trees that you're working on, right? And when I say, what is your value system? You know, is the scarless trunk the artist statement that you're working off of? Or is it more of a trunk where you say, I'm gonna make the lines and the cuts that I want, and then I'm gonna carve and hollow because that's what I see and that's the representation I wanna work with. I think this is the, the great Walter Paul deb debate online, you know, of people saying Walter's deciduous techniques are X, Y, and Z, and Japanese deciduous techniques look X, Y, and Z, and you say, yeah, but if Walter's not trying to accomplish the same thing as the Japanese aesthetic is trying to accomplish, how can you say that one is better, right, wrong, etc.? They're two different entire objectives. And I think you have to make that decision. For this piece, fast growing tree, rapid vascular productivity, thin bark, so we've gotta be careful. Uh, but we have the ability, even in big wound removal, to go ahead and make those decisions on the front of the trunk and have this recover. Very different from a Japanese maple, which is gonna take more time, show the, the, the impact of that reduction for a far longer period. However, even with all of that, if you go back and you watch the April 2020 initial structural pruning of this, I'm considering this front because all of the big wounds and the primary reason that this branch is still here. Interesting movement, great placement above this back branch, which we've changed the angle a little bit to show that. But this piece right here, if I cut this big wound on the front, if I keep this, cut this, I don't see that wound from the front. Always a consideration when you're starting with a woundless trunk. Try to preserve that. You can't preserve it at all costs because there may be a better design that demands that you open up a wound on the front of the tree, but you want to do so. It's like reducing a live vein on a juniper. You want to reduce a live vein on the juniper with the awareness of how that's going to impact, or excuse me, you want to reduce a branch on a juniper with the idea of how does that impact my living vein? How does the living vein on the front of the tree change with the reduction of a significant branch or a significant piece of tissue? On a deciduous tree, if I remove this, how does this change the front of the tree in terms of the scars or the potential damage that I'm gonna see for a number of years or potentially a number of decades, depending on the species, as this tree continues to progress? That's one of the mentalities that we have to have that's different from conifers as we handle broadleaf deciduous trees. All right up next is a question from Chuck. Chuck wants to know, can that trunk chop wound be angled a bit more now to enhance the taper, or does that have to wait until next year, or is it not a part of the plan for this tree? Uh, not a part of the plan, and here's why. Because that trunk chop wound is completely responsive to the swollen collar, and I do have a little bit of a V-shape right here where this collar right here actually comes up at an angle. This collar comes down, and there's a little bit of a dead spot here. Over the course of time, we'll probably take this out. We may even gouge this out now and hammer that out and create a little bit of transition there as according to where the colors occur. I also have a color up here that's relatively safe. Maybe I let this further progress, but I can't cut this at a desired angle here because I'll cut below that color and that's when we get dieback. And that's the continual fear when we start to tamper with the color that we have to be respectful of, okay? Now, 
when I'm handling this structural wire and I'm trying to manage my secondaries, again, I want to emphasize we are on that next round. This is not structural any longer. We are applying structural, we're improving structural, we're adjusting structural and further emphasizing, but we're really looking to handle these, these secondary pieces that have evolved. We're cutting back structural to secondary pieces that now occur, have matured, have thickened, have made themselves available and shown where we can cut and reduce some of those faulty primary structural pieces. So when I'm thinking about this, if I can, I would love to present those secondaries in a lateral form, not because we're trying to mimic a pad shape form, lateral form so that they have the space to then create tertiary ramification that has equal spacing. If we orient those secondaries here, when this grows and this grows, how do we handle those pieces now, right? This is that moment where we change that structural, get that lateral orientation. And even if there's a slight elevation change, love it. Right? This is a broadleaf notion to create the informal billow, boom. We can be here, can't be here. Maybe being here gives you the most flexibility, also might look a little bit more artificial, but you want to play in that lateral orientation. So as I'm kind of looking through here, I'm just trying to find in these tips where I have this uh, accumulation of secondary, I don't want to wire this down, I don't want to wire this down, I don't want to wire this down. This is not a traditional deciduous design. This is a really authentic linden in a miniaturized form. And as a result of that, if you compare this to, say, the Chinese quince that was designed with a very sort of lateral or even slightly downward, more pine-shaped form, we laid that out into more or less a, a pad formation. With this one, I love this formation here. This is exactly, bring me in tight there, Josh. This is exactly what I'm looking for in deciduous formation. This is a good deciduous branch, but what I see here is that I see, and let me turn this towards you, notice how tightly bound these are together. I want to move this out into space. I want to shift this out away. I want to isolate and give these their time and their room to continue to evolve. Yes, beautiful shot right there. I love that. I want to give that space here. I want to move this into space there. And, and in doing so, we take this and we open it up and give it more space for tertiaries to occur, okay? So I'm thinking about this process every time that I come back and I do this reworking and I, and I further conceptualize how we can evolve and improve the quality and the shape of the tree. And I'm just trying to find the correct gauge to go from these secondaries to be able to give me that kind of control so that I can just sort of work through branch by branch. I've already applied the big pieces. I'm already getting some of the structural issues reconciled. Branch by branch, kind of evolving. And this is really where I feel like we have to understand the pace and the, and the cadence of broadleaf work and how it differs from conifers. If this is a conifer, you can kind of assume that in the second working, you're going to be stacking wire on the original structural wire and the original application of wire. Unless you've let it grow too long, trees accumulated a lot of vascular tissue, right, where you maybe have to unwire the whole thing. You would ideally be uh, handling this tree at a point in time where you can stack that wire and you can take those secondary extensions, you can take those secondary additions, new growth on a juniper, on a spruce, on a, on a larch, on a fir, on a, on a taxis, on a pine. You take those and you wire those out, but you're not taking everything off. We know soft, thin bark deciduous that we really have to be watching for those wire scars. So we've taken this whole thing off. We don't come back and rewire the whole thing again. That's not what we're trying to do. We're now managing those secondaries. And in managing them, just being very strategic about what we do wire, how we wire, where we wire, if we are pursuing a natural representation or a more authentic growth habit in the aesthetic of the composition, we're just trying to find the outliers now. The pieces that exist, we're trying to change these lines of transitions for the, the, the structural things that we're correcting in this second working. I'm really trying to be discriminating of the amount of wire that I put on this tree at this time. I'm not shy to put on wire, but I'm intentionally considering how much wire am I putting on. And that's a major hurdle to cross in the mentality of broadleaf work as it differs from the coniferous model. Right. I got a question from Kevin Ferris. Um, you might have mentioned this before, but when was this last repotted? And with the work done tonight, could you, in theory, repot it this spring if a tree needed to be repotted? Yeah, so this was repotted, um, let's see, 2019. And then we did the big pruning 2020. And then uh, we did the big structural setting late uh, fall 2020. Now we're in fall 2021. Could I, in theory, 
uh, repot next year. I could repot next year if I wanted. Two years in a container for a broadleaf tree is, is a totally viable time to come back in and potentially rework the roots. And in fact, I think there's, you know, especially on young broadleaf trees, that sort of two-year mark, um, or if you're in a very shallow container, say with a very flat-based Japanese, something like that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That, and that might make uh, perfect sense. This tree, um, I feel, develops roots a little bit, although vigorously develops roots a little bit more slowly, just the same as it develops its tertiary ramification a little bit more slowly than some of our more highly ramifiable pieces, like a trident, like a Japanese maple. And so from that perspective, if I can squeak out another year, not slow down the progression of the, of the, um, of the foliar mass and the branching as a result of reducing the root system, uh, I want to. Especially at this point, I want to, because that allows me to carry and piggyback them, that momentum forward, okay? Area here where I have callus forming on the end of this cut, I assumed I would get buds back here at the base. I don't have buds at the base. I don't quite have a collar formed here, except for right here in the immediate vicinity, and I see a high degree of susceptibility for this to die back right there. Because of that, even now, I've got to wait. Okay, now what I'm getting, and I don't know if Jesus can see this, probably not. I've got tiny little buds, and I've got about five little buds right around the shoulder of this piece that are starting to amass and create a really beautiful collar with where this branch connects here. Because I don't have that collar on the backside, much like we waited on the upper canopy, I'm going to wait. So now the progression of this is just to change the direction and continue to guide these pieces, continue to work these pieces and expand these into the interior. It's this continued progression of really massaging the secondaries and making the accurate decisions. Don't rush. You're not there yet. You're continuing to evolve the behavior of your broadleaf deciduous to prevent the same considerations that you had in the structural initial cutback over the course of its evolution. Patience is your virtue when you're handling broadleaf deciduous material. Okay, up next is Ricky. How do you decide whether to prune back a branch for potential advantageous buds or to cut a branch back further to develop taper and shorter inner nodes? Yeah, so that's a really interesting uh, discussion. I think when you're in a very raw state, right, you're in a very, very raw state of development, you say, I'm going to cut this back, I'm going to get buds, this is too long, it's too coarse, etc. cetera. Um, doing that across the tree at that point, ramping up the tree's behavior, you saw us, we did the big cutback, I let it grow, everything really hulked out. The next time we set structure, it grew again, but there's more pieces growing and that uh, strength of that growth is distributed more evenly. Each time we cut this back and we work this, it grows less and less vigorously in any one area because we're creating so many more tips that the energy that's contained inside of this small environment is distributed across, okay? So when we do those big cutbacks, it's one of the most important things about the initial cutback is to make that really confident and decisive cutback happen as kind of a singular, if you can, if you can, sort of a singular uh, wholesale uh, system action that you perform on the branching so that you get the elicited or, or, or desired response that allows you to maximize patch, heal, and move forward from that really big cut. So I'm trying as much as I possibly can in the branching here to not cut back too heavily. I tried to make very decisive decisions in that initial cutback, and now I'm trying to piggyback on those. That's the ideal progression. Now, could I cut a big branch off now? I could. Would the tree compartmentalize it as effortlessly? No, it would not. And this is what we have to understand about broadleaf deciduous, is that you really have one chance. There's a, 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 a discussion, right, in bonsai in general as a practice, kill it or make it a bonsai, right? Now, I don't like that discussion. I don't like that discussion at all. But kill it or make it a bonsai is a very quick and effortless way to say, hey, listen, when this tree has the most momentum, the most stored sugars and starches, has not been calmed down, constricted, or constrained by the shallow containerized environment, that's when you make big moves. It's when you bare rooted. It's when you cut big thick roots. It's when you cut back big branches 
and the tree responds. The longer that it's in here, the harder that is. The more gradual we have to reduce. The less aggressive the budding is going to be as a result of that cut. And so we need to understand, maybe we put a tree in a grow box, get it ramped up again so that we can make big heavy cutbacks should we not have done that or maybe we're taking over ownership of a tree that needs that to be really reinvigorated. But you've got to build a tree up to have the response that you want from that behavior. And that's a big part that's not discussed in broadleaf deciduous work. Build the tree up to respond as a part of the process. All right. Next question is from Gary. Uh, follow a question. What is the sign that it's too late to do this work for a tree in refinement? There isn't a sign necessarily, right? We understand that there's a massive amount of disproportionate sugar stored at the tip because it's been reabsorbing all of that broken down chlorophyll and that cellular content from the leaf mass through the petiole and it's all highly concentrated in these branch tips right now. And we know that this tree has to have even even distribution of sugars and starches over the course of its entire system in order for it to go dormant and feel good about or have the kind of guideposts necessary in terms of energy distribution, bud potential, uh, and, and its growth habits set up next year. So we're playing on the fact that we're going to have, whew, excuse me, that even distribution, we're gonna have that even distribution taking place, and because we're gonna have it taking place, we're actually timing all of our actions to take advantage of that redistribution of sugar, okay? So when we start to think about this, what's the tail end of that? The farther and farther you get from the leaves having reabsorbed that pigment, the more and more distributed it is, the less and less you can do. And generally, we say the two-week window is safe, the three-week window is probably maxing it out. Four weeks, you're way outside of sugar starch redistribution, system is balanced, and you no longer have the capacity to make these cuts effectively. Up next is Elias. Uh, with very old looking deciduous bonsai such as this, do you ever consider putting it in a massive setting like a lone old tree in a field? I always felt like massive lone tree feels very nostalgic. Oh, I was just, that's so interesting that you say that um, because we were just looking at a tree today which um, has like, it's a, it's a Kingsville boxwood, very special Kingsville boxwood. We did the one Kingsville boxwood on the stream Rodney Clemens coming at the beginning of November. It is time Rodney's coming to rock out on, on boxwood and break down sort of the, the annual progression of work, fundamentals of boxwood, et cetera. I'm really excited to learn with you all uh, about what Rodney has to say. He and his uh, partner, Charlie, have been working on boxwoods for so long. She's incredibly knowledgeable, so is Rodney, and they're gonna, uh, or, or Rodney's gonna break it down for us, rather. Um, but uh, I have uh, Kingsville, that uh, looks like the angel oak, almost identical to the angel oak in, in Charleston, South Carolina. And one of the things that we were talking about today is do we put in it in a container that is actually bigger than the tree to show the tree inside of this more spatial dominant composition? And I have not seen that done, or at least I have not seen that done with uh, uh, a really significant uh, amount of consideration to the degree that it, it, it didn't look, you know, that it looked intentional and didn't look like a tree swimming in a bathtub. And that's the risk, right? When the container is too big for the tree, sometimes the container can take over a lot of that attention and aesthetic that we would want the tree to have placed on it. And so can we do that? I don't know, but we're working on it. And that might be something that we actually invest in in the stream next spring is, is that container shift uh, I want to work through that tree on the stream, and I also want to explore container opportunities on the stream, okay? Now, let me just walk you through where I'm at here because I'm really trying to change in this backside here. This front piece had a lot more sort of layout and kind of fundamental branching already constructed. This back piece is an amalgamation. We were really redirecting the growth. There was nothing on the interior because we took this big branch off of the top of it. So we've been pushing things back into the interior to occupy this space and start to build that informality in here. We have a lot more work to do on the secondaries now, consequently, because we've been in that build process. Secondary build, elongation taking place, thickening taking place, we're creating those secondary branches, improving the transition of taper, healing wounds, but this means we also have to wire a little bit more. So I'm gonna spend some time just kind of massaging this area as we continue to talk uh, and discuss how we handle these pieces. All right, up next is 
Nick S., it looks like the tree could use a branch above the large wound you were discussing, not only for healing, but to fill a large gap in the design. Could you do a thread graft for this linden, or are the buds too big? Are there any other options? Um, yeah, I think the buds are too big, and that's one of the big pro that's <laughs> too big. That's one of the big problems, right? That is the big problem, is that they're too big. Um, when we start to deal with coarser deciduous, uh, broadleaf deciduous species, we can get into those instances where, yeah, we really can't necessarily strike whatever would be ideal. And I think, I think ideal, when we start to say like, oh, I would love to have a branch here, here, and here. I would love a branch thread grafted here. Yes, and I can also grow these out and most natural trees don't have ideal settings for branches. And how do we piggyback on the fact that perfect or ideal doesn't exist and where does that create uniqueness and opportunities to do things with design? And I think this handling of this branch is one of those moments where this, that, the response to the lack of branching here is really what guided the move of this piece into the interior. And I like this move. This is a move that you really do have to kind of acclimate to over the course of time because we're taught in bonsai, oh, you don't take a branch back into the interior of, a, of the tree. In fact, a lot of times those branches in the beginner uh, understanding of bonsai, those are the branches that we're cutting off and we say, okay, we take off everything off the bottom, everything off the top, we take off branches growing back to the interior. But in all actuality, when you're doing a structural setting, and, and I'll never forget the moment that this happened where I came to understand this to a much more significant degree. Mr. Kimura had a Japanese red pine uh, from Daiso Iwasaki. It was a raw tree, Korean red pine. Branches were all grafted down low on this behemoth of a tree that was collected uh, and imported to Japan long ago. And there was a big space. Branch dropped down. All the foliage was at the tips. Uh, and Arushibata was wiring it. And he wired a big branch up into the interior, turned it around, and created a pad. Now, that was red pine aesthetically driven. And that was necessity to close a negative space to compress the design of the tree. Five years later, that's the first year of my apprenticeship, five years later, after that's thickened, after that's barked up, after that's ramified, it looked like that was a contiguous part of the natural trunk movement and behavior of the tree, and you never could have imagined that somebody intentionally turned a very thin, underdeveloped secondary branch into the interior to form that pad. This is exactly what will happen here. It's exactly what has happened when we see trees that we say, look, there's no branching that's moving towards the interior of the tree. And then you go back to the structure. You go back to the prominent superstructure of the tree and you see the superstructure or the prim primary structure of the tree returning to the back. That was done long ago when that branch was just a small little singular shoot or a very, very small malleable piece. So understand, we're gonna build this in here. It's gonna look natural in three to four years, like it always existed that way, but we created that from a singular shoot from the very beginning, understanding how that's going to evolve over the course of time. And these are the small little pieces of trickery that, that, that knowing the nuance of time, putting in movement that looks natural and consistent aesthetically with how the tree has been handled or its natural growth habit, this is how we create that quality and really build on uh, our capacity to manipulate the concept of aesthetics in the tree. All right, up next is a question from Paul from Sacramento. Uh, what aluminum wire sizes do you typically keep on hand for deciduous work? Yeah, I try to have all of them. I was actually, Paul, before we started, I was looking through stuff. Now I'm, I'm, I'm wiring these kind of relatively small, fine secondaries. This is 2.5, maybe a little beefy. Um, <clears throat> 7.5 for the heavy stuff. I was working anywhere between four and six for some of the other structural pieces that, that I was working on. Um, but I like to have all, all aluminum gauges on hand. Obviously in this tree, I'm not gonna be using one, 1 1.5, et cetera. It's, it's just, there's too many um, big pieces uh, that need redirection. And this, this particular tree, which you also are familiar with, Lyndon, obviously, um, this particular tree has longer inner nodes, coarser branching, even in its most refined phase. And so using 2.5 as just sort of a fudge gauge when we're working on these secondaries, knowing that we can get away with it and it keeps us from having to switch wire gauges and really decrease the efficiency of the work um, feels completely and totally acceptable to me. But um, I try to have them all based on the fact, especially when we get into maples, where you can really make more refined, there's a more delicate branching, it doesn't have as much flex and give. You can make those more refined decisions customized to the tree's needs. 
Up next is Keegan. Should we be thinking to do all of our winter deciduous trimming in the next month or so rather than waiting until close to bud push in the spring? Well, so Keegan, I want to be very careful about saying yes to you specifically because you and I have had conversations about the fact that where you're at in, in Southern California, if you prune your elms at, at leaf drop, where you do have some partial evergreen, partial deciduous behavior in your pomegranates, your elms, and some of these pieces, that you've experienced a large amount of branch dieback as a result of fall pruning, right? There are always gonna be nuances. I, I can't really tell you all of those nuances, but if that's the case, then you definitely would want to wait, right? You would want to wait until you, um, until you have bud swell in the spring because you've seen that happen and that might be an, a mechanism of the partial evergreen, partial deciduous behavior that is specific to your region, your environment, your garden, et cetera, right? But for me, here in the Pacific Northwest, I do find this to be a very favorable time. I do like to go about uh, completing the work. I like to go about pruning as well as wiring. I'm gonna be doing uh, significant work on Japanese maples on the stream, some tridents over the course of the next three weeks, some crab apples. We have a really, really beautiful lineup of deciduous work to really kind of dive into design specifically in the techniques of handling deciduous at this time of year. But I know that I don't have to worry about dieback uh, next spring and in fact, the motivation if we have to talk about it, the motivation of pruning at this time of year is because we have all these sugars and starches unevenly distributed through the tree. When we prune now and they're evenly distributed across all of the buds that remain, you get an even strength distribution across those buds. This is one of the most primary pieces of information that reinforces fall pruning as the best practice to get even energy distribution next spring, especially on a refinable tree in areas where it works, okay? So I throw that out to you as this is why I do it. I get more even distribution based on homogenization of sugar starch across the buds that are left, whereas next spring you prune, stronger are gonna push first, weaker are gonna be stimulated uh, several weeks or maybe even months later you have an uneven distribution and now you're trying to catch up to that. If it works for you, great. Sergio Quan podcast, he said, I just prune, I don't wire. Pruning is important, even distribution, wiring, I get die back in New Jersey. Okay, cool. Everybody's gotta find their nuance to their area that allows them to have success. Okay, I'm just working on this last little piece and I'm, I'm gonna leave some branches, you know, I'm gonna kind of work through it. Maybe we come back and we wire those pieces. I don't want to, um, I don't wanna get into sort of the, the, the movement of wiring everything, just the pieces that need it. And we might see as we work through the rest of the tree that we have to go back and give movement or put, uh, put positioning into pieces that we thought were okay. This is a part of the broadleaf deciduous model, okay? And again, just setting your sights on the fact that I'm not gonna be wiring everything. That's not the goal of this, right? The goal is to only wire what we have to wire. But in the secondary working, when I'm at this point, where I've gotten this expansion on a primary structural uh, pruning and, and design, absolutely acceptable to go harder, go farther, and use that wire to really try and set and, and, and confirm, finalize some of those decisions, structural spots, and, and aesthetics within the tree. Okay, so I, I might be moving back and forth a little bit throughout the process of this tree. It's totally okay. That's a part of how we go about that broadleaf work. All right, up next is Gary. Why did you use paper towels on the wire last time, but not this time? Yeah, good question, Gary. So last time I used um, copper wire on the structural setting. And when I'm doing the really big bending, especially when I'm dealing with four, six, and eight, which I'm gonna tell you four, six, four and six give me far more holding capacity than the 7.5 aluminum, right? So that just goes to tell you if six is giving me, if six millimeter or if, if six gauge uh, copper is giving me more holding capacity than 7.5 millimeter, which is the thickest aluminum that I have, what does four give me? Four gives me, boom. Four gives me the maximum holding capacity, okay? But once I get those big moves set, I'm just trying to further the structural work that I'm doing now. And so in trying to further the structural work, I don't need necessarily that same aggressive holding capacity to do the paper towel wraps, although I do have copper here and I do have paper towels cut, if in case I needed them. I don't like to mix materials when I style bonsai, if I can at all avoid it. 
Um, and so if I can go straight aluminum just to kind of make things clean and concise and I don't need that same emphasis of structural push, I will absolutely take the opportunity to move into on a soft bark deciduous tree, just aluminum and not have to go through the paper wrapping process. That's a good question. I knew, I was hoping that would come up because I am making that transition in secondary work. And again, this is part of the narrative arc that you should expect as you evolve a broadleaf deciduous tree to move from that copper paper wrap into that aluminum, knowing that we've gotten a majority of the structure set the way we want it. All right, up next is a question from Rafi. Uh, Rafi's wondering why you're keeping the thick tip on the branch that you're working on. Now that was from, that was at 36, that was about 20 minutes ago. Uh, it is a big angle and there is a nice big obtuse angle branching nearby. Um, because, and this is really, this is sort of the thing, right? Like there's, there's a general notion that good broadleaf work is to always be cutting off the thicker branches. But I, but, but, but I don't understand who says that. Who says that that's the goal? Who says that that's the move? And you know what that gives us is, and I continue to kind of, I continue to say this, not as a, a derogatory statement, but just to bring attention to, hey, hey, if that's what gets you a good broadleaf deciduous tree, why do we not have more masterpieces in North America? We have a lot built. You know, we talked about it in terms of the critique which I also do need to give credit where credit's due. The Zelkova was not a Yuji Yoshimura tree. It was Steve Ohm's tree. He did it, cultivated that tree from the beginning, constructed that broom style Zelkova, and I do think it was the best deciduous tree in that exhibition. I apologize for the mistake. But when we start to talk about this, outside of those outliers, we, we have so many more broadleaf trees cultivated across North America when you consider east of the Rocky Mountains, and yet where, where are the abundant where are the abundant examples or samples of quality if we are doing it to the best of our capacity, right? And one of the big limitations is the constant discussion of cutting back, cutting back, cutting back. You can cut back this branch to a finer branch. Why shouldn't we do that? Do, do you have something built to cut back to? Because this has been my whole discussion from the beginning is you have to wire broadleaf deciduous. You have to use the branching. You have to reposition it. You have to structure it. You have to build the replacements. To cut a tree back and then regrow it, I don't know that I've seen a big cutback and regrowing in terms of cutting all these back to stumps and regrow. I don't know that I've ever seen a good tree come from that, or at least not in any sort of realistic time frame. Okay? And so when we look at this, to handle this, to work this, to put these branches into position, that's how we continue to build. As I build better branching, much like I did here on that cutback, and I have those pieces in place, and I can improve the aesthetic, and I can uh, enhance the transition of taper, that's when I cut it back, when I've already built it. But to, to, to cut back and say, I'm going to go ahead and sacrifice all this, sacrifice asymmetry, sacrifice the consideration of the design to get to a finer branch, do we improve the tree with that actually, or can we just wait, build that finer branch, and when it's time to cut back, cut back? That's the methodology that I prefer. Okay, I'm going to go ahead, and what I'm trying to do here is I'm just trying to get a little bit of a transition of this branch out from underneath this. And I'm using a guy wire. I'm kind of weaving through these very delicate buds that exist here that I don't want to damage. And I'm just coming to a stump that I'm not yet quite ready to clean up, but it's at the very tip of this branch. And these are kind of some of these little moments where I can take advantage of just a, a, a slight stump, right? that I know I'm going to have to cut back over the course of time. I'm going to take advantage of that as an anchor spot for the movement of this piece, okay? So these, these kinds of just opportunities, this is where I feel like broadleaf trees, when we're working them, when we're styling them, et cetera, have a few of these kind of design hacks, if you will. They have these moments that are not as concise as a conifer, and I'm gonna go ahead and just change my direction because I keep pulling that piece right off of that. Let me go ahead and just get this lined up here. Okay, but they have these like, design hacks that kind of allow us to not fudge necessarily, but think about the styling process a little bit differently, right? Because guy wires and deciduous, you don't see a lot of people put guy wires on deciduous, or you see guy wires literally from every single root in the container moving up through the canopy of the tree. I don't want that either. That sounds terrible, right? But, but guy wires are important. They're important, and if we're talking about secondary, continuing to advance, the structure of the tree, there we go. Just had to rethink it. Just had to be smooth about it. Be cool, man, be cool. 
Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and just gradually, okay, and I want to be careful. Linden will tear, very, very soft, fleshy. Okay, and I just hook onto that right there. Really, really nice movement of that branch out into that space, and it also carries it up. It gives me a little bit of that upward movement there. Let me show you that now, show you that progression. Okay, moved it out from underneath here, and it moved it up, slightly up so that it's not so horizontal. I love that move right there. I love that move, and I love how those lower branches are starting to work out. That's a really beautiful enhancement, done, done, structural, done here. We're already making tremendous progress, okay? Those little, little design, little areas where we can take advantage, we can lessen the workload of trying to figure out where else could we anchor this. God, I'm gonna put a screw in, I don't wanna scar the bark. Oh, I've got a little tiny stub here, it's not gonna hurt that at all, I'm gonna prune that back, that collar is all the way back here, so I know that's where I'm gonna short. Awesome, awesome, intelligent bonsai. Got a question from Chuck. Chuck says, maybe it's the season talking, but this tree has a slightly menacing spookiness about it, which <laughs> was our goal, Chuck. So you nailed it on the coffin. Uh, is the, get it? Nailed it on the coffin? Ha <laughs> ha. Okay, anyways. Ooh, wow, um, wow. <laughs> Too hot. Too hot. <laughs> is the plan to fill out the foliage and make it a lush tree with long, thin tertiaries or keep the branching course and move uh, and more sparse like an old tree in a cemetery? Yeah, I, I, uh, so we have a better spooky tree for you, just barely better, but it, <laughs> it, it is better uh, for our end of October stream that I'm really excited about and everybody's going to be psyched to see it again. Um, but I think we have to play to the behavior of the tree and Linden is not some hyper, hyper refined, um, thin, thin twiggy tree. Now we want to increase that, we wanna push the boundaries of the species as far as we possibly can. Um, but as it stands now, and as I sort of consider this piece, um, it's going to carry forward this kind of spooky, chunky, coarser aesthetic until I can get it to the far threshold of what it can facilitate. And once I get it there, will it lose that? No, Linden's always gonna maintain some of that. That's a part of Linden. The, the leaves are huge, the behavior of the species is very strong and aggressive, based on that large photosynthetic engine that it has, okay? Now, when I deal with this here, okay, I want to move this branch, but I want to move this branch from this location here, right? That doesn't mean that I shouldn't have wire at the base of this, but there's no way that I'm gonna leave my structural wire air bridging this gap. I'm just simply using this as an anchor because I'm gonna come back based on wire dynamics, and this is where we were talking about. If I understand I'm moving this here, this branch wants to return here. This piece right here is going to be the stabilizing component. If I'm moving there, it wants to return here, right? I have to have a piece stopping that return from coming back. I'm gonna be able to cut that, bring this piece down, hold it, bend, and it should support it. Let's see if our knowledge of wiring dynamics actually allows this to work. And I like this technique it's a technique we use on show trees. I showed you that with the, the show wiring of the Engelmann spruce. Uh, but this is also something I like to use on broadleafs because we don't have, if we want to avoid wiring everything, we want to avoid an abundance of wire on the tree. We don't necessarily have anchor points for all of these different occurrences that are gonna be taking place over the styling. We do have to understand wiring dynamics and come up with some of those solutions. So again, I could cut, it's aluminum, I'll go ahead and bend, right? I'm gonna keep that in that shoulder. I'm gonna drop this down here, right on that shoulder, okay? So now I'm gonna hold here, and I'm just gonna go ahead and I'm gonna move that piece, okay? And I remember last time this piece didn't move, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna use a second piece of wire. And let's just see if we can get enough force on there that we can move that. I'll show you how that works once we accumulate that wire. I like these tricks. These tricks make uh, any situation something that we can tackle in terms of strategy and technical application. I've got a great pairing right here. I've got a standalone piece right there that I could utilize a little bit more distribution of that branching. I'm gonna go ahead and pair these two and piggyback on, right? Original piece, 7.5 millimeter for Paul. This one's gonna be five millimeter for this step down, still structural. That 7.5 plus the five, is it gonna give me movement here? I predict it will give me the movement that I want, right? But this is where you see aluminum as a, as a definite limitation compared to copper, where you say four gauge, 
I'm gonna get that movement and then I'm gonna have some to spare. In aluminum, I'm doubling up just to hope to get that movement. And you know the phototropic powerhouse of that broadleaf deciduous, high water mobility, high sugar starch productivity. When we have high water mobility, we get a lot of hormonal accumulation happening very, very rapidly. Okay, and so from that perspective, if I use too thin of a wire, this may only hold for a very short period of time over the next spring before it just blows out. It overpowers the holding capacity of the wire. That's okay though, because we're gonna have to be taking this wire off very, very soon after the, the growth hardens next sort of late spring, early summer. I'm gonna set that alert in my phone so that I am reminded to do so and I can let go of it, not try to keep every single tree in my mind or remember to look at those trees, okay? Here we go. I'm gonna hold this piece here, nice and snug, just at the base of that shoulder. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna bend. Now watch this. You're gonna watch that wire close back down against that shoulder right there, okay? So as I bend here, it pulls that wire off. You get that movement. If I hold that into that shoulder and I bend, now that closes back down around that wire. We get that holding capacity with the doubled up effect. We get that distribution that we're looking for in that broadleaf model, okay? And we'll kind of work through. Yeah. Eyes on this right here? Yeah, totally, okay? So I'm just gonna hold here. Now I've already bent it twice, so I'm not gonna bend it. But when I move here, right? And then I go ahead, that branch wants to return. It pushes that aluminum back into that shoulder. And now I can go ahead, if I can get my, there, come on, Ush. okay? And I can go ahead and cut that. Now you see, that has an impact. Watch this, watch this branch. Just by touching that, has an impact, right? So I'm playing on wire dynamics very intensely when I'm holding this on that shoulder. What does that mean? This is only a technique that I can apply when I'm moving this branch in a straight line direction, okay? So if I'm taking this branch, right, and I'm, and I'm moving it here, and it wants to return up, that's why we come over the top here, right? So I've been down, it wants to come up. I can cut this wire right there. As long as it has that contact point, I'm good, right? But if I try to move this branch here, or I try to move this branch here, the whole system blows up. So you have to understand, this is only applicable in a one direction movement but it is absolutely capable to play on wire dynamics and minimize the amount of wire that you put on a tree or to manage how that wire is connected to that branch to give function to its capacity to position and alter the aesthetic of the tree. Nice little trick there for you. All right, and I like right, pulling that side in. Right? We're saying that's a big, long branch. How do you pull it in? You take it away, come back, right? Okay, so we took that all the way to the back and suddenly it foreshortened that. Well, guess what? I don't have anything back here. This is a wonderful piece to be building back here. Nothing wrong with the branching there. Nothing wrong with that positioning of that structure. Gives interesting movement, stays consistent with the rest of the tree's design. Something really nice about being able to retrofit pieces that are not in ideal spaces but are still structurally sound enough to be utilized. All right, I uh, got a question um, from Bentley. This was just from a little bit ago, uh, just was asking for a clarification, but why did you move that branch back towards the interior again? Which one? Um, oh, this one back here? Yep. Because I don't have anything else to fill the space. So the discussion was, when we're talking about this piece coming back to the interior, there was a discussion of, do you want to thread graft a branch, right? And let's just say, okay, I thread graft a branch through here because I don't have anything, right? So I'm gonna thread graft a branch into this space right here. And I would say, well, I can reorient this branch, build a much more natural representation and accept that limitation knowing that the buds on, on Linden are so big that that, grafting, that thread grafting hole would have to be gigantic and my chances of success are gonna be more minimal. And I'm also not aspiring to have a perfect branch placement. That's why we move that to the interior. We wanna foreshorten this. That's why we move this to the back. Can we see the front just one more time? Front, 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 boom. West from Joe, thank you. Yep, there's your front. And I think you could probably go a little bit more here, which pushes this a little bit more out, turns that on the angle. We get a good movement. We've pulled it back, apex elevated, this to the back. We're just furthering, we're furthering the design concept. And by the end of this, when we compare it to where it started, where it progressed, 
structural secondary, you're going to see a monster improvement in the shape and design of this tree. And this is just, this is just the understanding when you say, OK, cool, that's great. We're going to see progression. I hope it progresses. Yes, I hope so too. But we have to make sure. And, and some of the progressions here that I want you to be aware of are, are the fact that I'm not doing the preloaded expectation of pruning off or cutting off a bunch of stuff. No. No, no, no. I haven't built anything necessarily yet. The pieces that I've built, I've already done the cutting on. That's the extent of the cutting tonight. I got a collar. I get to shorten that so I don't have to look at that right angle. I got a better secondary piece on both sides of this. I cut that piece off and I pull it off of the front of that. That's it. Everything else is staying. Now we're just wiring it out, dialing it in, and allowing it to really add to the ramification. With secondary growth, use it. Use it. Don't grow a tree and then cut it all off and think that you've done something. That's not doing something. That's wasting the tree's energy, effort. That's wasting your time and your input. Grow it, use it. Grow it, use it. Two steps forward, every once in a while, we come in and we check it, fix structural flaws, refine the transition of taper base to tip, cut back longer, coarser branches to interior, finer pieces that we've built to take its place, two steps forward, one step back two steps forward, one step, we're always progressing. That's the whole point. You grow it, you cut it all off, that's pointless. That's, that's, a, that's a pointless action in the bonsai process. Um, up next is a question from Paul in Sacramento. Were you able to get a second flush from this tree this year? And I, yeah, so I got a minor second, but not really, not really. You know, partial defoliation uh, just ultimately gave me finer branching, finer tips, better energy distribution, uh, and it pushed for the pieces that I did not partially defoliate because I wanted developmental things to occur, thickening, elongation, wound healing, etc. It increased those developmental goals in the area where I left the leaves uh, completely intact and did not reduce or prune. Um, but no, I did, I did not, and I have to be honest with Tilia. I think Sergio said that they just grow so aggressively for him that he gets, uh, he gets second and third flushes from partial defoliation. I know um, I have another student who's up in upstate New York, and he says, hey, Lyndon's here. You know, it's like you have to be so careful because they just grow so aggressively that if you're not careful, they're, they're going to completely hulk out in a single season. I don't experience that. I don't experience that kind of vigor. I don't know if that is a uh, cultivation thing. I don't know if that is a little leaf linden versus big leaf linden thing. I don't know if, and for Sergio, I know it's not because the little leaf linden that he's working with is of the same genetics as we uh, have in the Pacific Northwest. So I don't know what that is. But if you didn't get one, Paul, you're not, uh, you're not sort of alone in that. It, 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 it wasn't a year where I got that either. All right, uh, up next is a question from Treebeard Steve. Most tropical species move water as fast and grow as vigorously as do deciduous broadleaves. Would you agree that most of the same principles apply except those that have to do with seasonal changes on the calendar? Um, yeah, so this was the big discussion that David Cutchins and I have had um, in terms of tropicals. Tropicals are a broadleaf tree and historically or typically a broadleaf evergreen tree. Um, when you talk about broadleaf, significant solar panels, significant surface area for transpiration, significant water mobility, right? All of those things uh, are, are, are the same. Now, is the, is, the, is the calendar changed? Absolutely, because tropicals are functioning uh, differently at higher temperatures, at higher amounts of humidity, um, and that's where we really do start to alter our expectation of timing and application of technique. Okay, cool. So be it. But are they still a broadleaf? Yes, they are a broadleaf. And consequently, as a broadleaf, it does sort of lock them into a similar behavior. OK, now I'm going to go ahead. And you're not seeing me shorten many shoots here. But I am going to make a decision on a piece where it's continued to get very, very thick. This is a secondary piece taking over the transition of taper here. And you'll notice I have two buds, one, two, right at the base here, very tight inner node length. Okay, and then I skyrocket into that longer inner node and I have a bud here that I had cut back to. I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna cut that back. Now the question that we should be asking ourselves is why cut that one and not all the other ones? Because this is as thick as I want it to get where it's at. 
I have very tight inner nodes. I want even distribution of energy across the buds. So that means cutting that big tip back. If I let it grow next year and consume the energy, I might not get ramification at these pieces. And I don't want any further development taking place. So I'm happy to take that stronger tip off. That would be why I went ahead and cut that. Not many places on this tree am I desiring that consistency or that type of response. But in the areas that I do, that would be where taking the, the um, action of pruning. And I also want to compress on this right side. Here's another one, even though I said I'm not going to do it. There you go. Right? So that is why I would be handling those tips. But if you want development, if you want further elongation, thickening, et cetera, don't cut those tips. Don't cut those tips. Right? Secondary build, I'm going to get tertiary uh, in terms of stimulating those things just by having the buds that I have on this piece, partial defoliation pruning, I've already transitioned. I don't need to cut again if I don't want to or don't have to, and I still have some pieces that need more secondary work. Okay, up next is a question from... We did tree beard. Up next is a question from Joe. Joe's curious if you could give a quick summary of what tasks can be done at this time of year, wiring, last fertilization, and possible repotting even. Last fertilization, you're probably past if your leaves are dropping last fertilization because it's, although you, I guess, you know, uh, depending on if, and, and I was, I got to say this. Let me just, let me just uh, say this for a minute. Um, you know, when, when we talk about mineral balancing, I know after the James Agent podcast, there was, uh, or at least I've, I've understood there to be some, some discussion of conflict or pseudoscience or something like that. Um, you know, James is making a product that is capable of translocating through the tree far beyond the performance of anything anybody's ever created before. Uh, whether or not his, uh, you know, his theories of the iron plow creating the dust bowl or, you know, uh, the, the flow rate of pH being a resistance factor for him, you know, all of this stuff, I, I, don't, I don't really care, right? Like James is making calcium that penetrates the tree. How do I know? Because David developed a test that proves it. There's no pseudoscience in, in James's product that Eden Solutions is creating. It's scientifically proven that he's right and that he can back. Now, whether or not that's how, you know, uh, agronomy needs to change or shit, argue about it all you want. Don't deny the quality of James's product, right? Now, is it right for bonsai? Do we have, I don't know. I don't know. We'll work on that, okay? From the perspective of nutrition, is it time for a last fertilization? Going back to your question, Joe, I think you're probably past the point where you get a real maximization of the fertilizer application. Could you apply fertilizer and are there products, supplemental nutrition, that could potentially still positively influence the tree? There are, there are. That can get into the, um, that can get in through the bark, that can penetrate the tissue, that could have some sort of, um, you know, impact on the tree. Is it going to be translocated from the roots up into the canopy? Actually, at this point in time, the tree is trying to downgrade uh, the quantity of water by stuffing the vacuoles full of sugars and starches. And that's where I actually feel like a trunk spray or like a, a, like a, like a we say foyer, there's no foyer mass on this, but there is branching that's very permeable, might be the, the most significant application that you could do right now. Banger scopes of work, as the leaves are dropping, pruning, to really reallocate and distribute energy evenly, um, or ant pruning and wiring, as far as where we're at in the Pacific Northwest. Now again, with Keegan, we went through this discussion. On the podcast with Sergio, we discussed a lot of these timing mechanisms and differences where we are located in the world. I'm talking too much, not focusing enough. <laughs> on a roll tonight. I'm really, I'm so excited about the evolution of this tree, especially seeing it image-wise prior to starting the, the, the discussion of this, um, that it's exciting to see it and exciting to be working on it. Um, but I think wiring and pruning, that's kind of your wheelhouse, Joe. All right. Okay, so I'm going 7.5 up in here. And that's a pretty 7.5, pretty tough for that smaller piece as long as we use good solid offhand support so that it doesn't slide. It's gonna give us obvious control over this smaller piece, okay? But really what I'm aspiring to have control of is this much bigger piece because we still need to drop this down. This has been a constant state 
of trying to get these pieces. I'm bringing this piece up, I'm bringing this piece down. We have a significant spacing here, and I want to continue to try and move the foyer mass and the branching structure of the linden into these spaces where I don't necessarily have those perfect ideal circumstances. Okay, so if I can think about this, if I can <clears throat> sort of conceptualize technically, Linden, so soft, almost succulently spongy soft. And we talked about that when we did the initial styling of this. Have to be a little careful because it can go in an instant. So when you're bending, you want to really, really just listen. There's like a that starts as the tissue tears. But that's a great, that's a great position for that piece. Really nice foreground, kind of steering it away from this lower piece so that they exist in their own respective locations. They can fundamentally photosynthesize. Really, really beautiful continuation of the original design. Tightening up, just tightening up, continuing, taking that structure, continuing to move it in the similar directions. A lot of these pieces, just the very slightest, when we unwired this, we unwired this as we partially defoliated it, just the slightest amount of pressure, few little locations where we can see where the wire was, as I come back and I wire now, most of those structural decisions I still need to reinforce to further enhance and improve. I'm, I'm wrapping the wire in the same direction. A lot of my combinations are the exact same combinations I utilize because I'm further emphasizing those pieces that I started with. Consequently, when we start thinking about that, I've got to be changing the point of contact where this thicker wire touches those branches because if I lay it back down on that location, even though it's had time since it was unwired, I still run the risk of that further imprinting on the branch, that presence and that pressure. And I don't want that to happen. That's why I took the, took the liberty to unwire it so that I prevented that. If I jump right back into that space, I absolutely jump right back into the creation of a wire scar. That will last with a soft bark tree forever, right? I'll never get it off this tree if I allow it to really embed itself. Okay, up uh, next is a question from Paul. Um, what is the molt, uh, motling, motling on the trunk? Is it lichen, fungus, coloration of the tree? I have it on my American hornbeam and I love the aesthetic, but will it damage or harm the tree? Is it natural? Oh, uh, the modeling uh, on the trunk, the white uh, splotches, etc. I just assumed this was a part, at least a part of this linden. Maybe there's some, maybe it's lichen, I don't know. That's a good question. I assumed it was just natural. It's, it's definitely not harmful. Um, and I, if it's not a bark characteristic, then it's something that is, is existing on the bark. I would have to believe it would be a lichen to exist in the, in the terrestrial part of the tree, the, the sort of, you know, not at the base, but actually up in the, in the airborne part of the tree on the trunk and in the primary branching. But, um, but I just always assumed that that was a natural part of it. If your Linda doesn't have it, maybe it is um, to some degree some definition or discussion of age or behavior, and that would be really interesting, but, um, but, but definitively not a, not a negative. All right, up next is a question from Rafi. Would now be a good time to thread graft a deciduous or better in the spring just in time as the buds are about to swallow? Uh, in swell. the spring. Yeah, in the spring. Don't do it now because although it's reallocating and compartmentalizing, it's not generating. It's not generating a lot of tissue. We're at the tail end of that. You really want to be putting a thread graft in and then just this tremendous flow of resources moving through that piece is what makes that thread graft take. Okay, I want to take you into this tip right here because this tip is one of the first tips where we've really gotten, and let me get this big thick wire out of the way, where we really have an opportunity to cut back. Okay, now I want to be using uh, a, a very sharp uh, tool to make this cut, but I have a junction here where I have some very close, concise, and go ahead and bring me in tight, Josh. Okay, I have this piece here, and I have this piece on the other side, and then I've got this central stem here. Now, it could be considered a fudgeable group of three, but I'm gonna take that back at this point in time, and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna cleanly remove the stump here, I'm gonna cleanly remove the tip here, that is one piece where when I look at the overall design, the length of this, because I have branches below it, and go ahead and show this, I'm gonna go ahead and rotate, okay, and I'm talking about the reduction cut was here, 
Okay, I don't want that to continue to elongate to the back. I don't want that to get bigger. Look at what I have coming above it. Look at what I have below it. If I want these to really be empowered, I've got to hold back some of these upper pieces. That's a move to preserve the design sustainability. Sustainability from the photosynthetic efficiency of the way I lay out the branches. I do have the ability and the necessity when we start to talk secondary, some pieces are going to be into that tertiary level or necessitate that tertiary level of working and considering uh, how we continue to drive those forward with quality. That was a moment where really backing off on that coarse tip made sense for the first time as far as this tree is concerned. All right, up next is Big So Cal Matt. Sorry if you covered this already, but are you going to encourage the cows to roll over that cut and are you going to use the Fordham to chip out the pithy wood? Yeah, so um, for if we're talking about this piece back here, I am gonna either have to use the Fordham to grind out that, that, that wood if I want this to roll better, and that could be, you know, this one stayed hydrated. Notice that the, the putty is still on this one. Maybe that's because it's not facing upwards, upward orientation, more exposure to the sun. Also, maybe the wood underneath this dried out faster because there's not as much water being pulled through it, and that's why the putty, I didn't take the putty off, it fell off. Okay, and consequently, this is probably getting softer, and consequently, we're not getting as good of a callus roll. Probably, we need to retreat this wound, and that would make sense. Now, the wound up here on the top, I'm gonna do all of this wound work. I'm gonna do that with a gouge, hammer and gouge. I'm gonna make sure that I get it just right, clean up that edge, putty that, and start that process up there, whereas this is going to be that second working, maybe even come back and backfill with a two-part epoxy that gives me that solid foundation that won't imbibe water. We talk about that in wound formation or callus formation, wound healing on broadleaf trees. We did it on that Chinese quince where you saw that those wounds are all closing very beautifully now as a result of that work. It's a pretty flawless uh, technique once we understand how we go about it and the strategy to go about it to get that uh, deciduous or broadleaf wound roll to, to be reinvigorated by the establishment of a foundation that allows it to uh, roll with, without imbibing the moisture. And that's the biggie. That's the biggie that really slows or stops that process, okay? I'm just working this wire kind of in and underneath that guy wire piece right there so that I have stability. I stopped the carryover of that 7.5 before I got to this piece. I wanna get this out so that I can start to make decisions on the opposite side about length, okay? Because even though we're doing a broadleaf tree, now entering the secondary formation, we do want to, just like I shortened that piece over there and I said this is the first moment where I can really kind of focus on a reduction, strength, sustainability, et cetera. I want to be working uh, to compress on one side and elongate on another. I don't think that we talk a lot about how we compress, elongate, and generate that informal billow that gives us asymmetry. But I want asymmetry in this tree. This tree without asymmetry is just going to be a big, coarse, globular mess of branching. And that's not attractive. That's never going to be attractive, okay? So as I kind of start to look at this, these pieces that give this asymmetrical push and length, these are the pieces that I need to be using as my reference for how far I'm going to be reducing on this right side and pushing on this left side, right? And this is one of the biggies right here when we get into the upper canopy of the tree. Broadleaf trees typically upper canopy pushing out on linden lower branches can be very thick and aggressive. Everything here consistent, but I wanna to continue to drive this upper canopy push as much as I possibly can. Right, up next is a question from Ricky. Have you ever heard or seen anyone growing vines or sumac or an effeminite or something up a deciduous trunk? Um, ooh, like a vine? Yeah. I think Eve was talking about doing that. I am, but I was going to do it on a tree that's already, uh, it's, a, it's a carcass. Oh, it's, oh, it's a deceased? Yes, tis, tis deceased uh, because I can control what is dead. Yeah, no, I've never heard anybody doing that, but <clears throat> there's been a lot of discussion uh, in the forum uh, Q&A and the live Q&A about the behavior of vines recently. And vining, vining plants in general are just so incredibly vigorous. Um, that I think one of the challenges, if you were to integrate them to grow up the trunk of, a, of an existing broadleaf tree, balancing the energy and the resource consumption in the containerized environment, I could see as a challenging proposition, okay? Not to say that it's not doable, not to say that it's not worthy, just saying, hey, 
That's going to be very, very challenging. Maybe you accept the challenge. All right, up next is Brian. Will you greenhouse the deciduous trees that you work on this fall, even for a brief period, to allow cracks to heal scars and start the hardening off? Um, no, because any, any kind of crack tear uh, that, I, that I have, if I got a break, if I got a big break on an important branch, yes, I would have to. That would be the exception. But for any tears or any sort of superficial pieces, I'm gonna touch those up with callus mate. As soon as they possibly occur, you know, this tree uh, will, will have the wound work done tomorrow. Um, and I'll touch up with callus mate tomorrow on any tears or any areas. But again, because we did, and this is really where I want to not, not say that you have to, but encourage you to consider this when you set the structure of your broadleaf trees. A lot of times I think people take the short route of, of, of say making big prunes and then you know not wiring and then two or three years later it grows and they prune again and you still haven't wired and ultimately what you've done is you've kind of wasted two or three years cut it all off every time it's grown and not really made much progress right this is time consumptive deciduous broadleaf trees are time consumptive in the styling process just like a conifer if you want to do it well but um, to do the work, to put the wire on, to set the structure, and to push the envelope of, of the tree in the beginning is to make it far easier now. So in doing this secondary, and this is really where I want to emphasize, this is secondary work. This is continuation of the structural work, of the primary work that we've already done. Because I pushed it so hard in the secondary styling, this is effortless now. This is, this is, this is easy work because all I'm doing is I'm just extending on, I'm piggybacking on, I'm carrying forward the theme that I started to create in that initial structural piece, and I'm taking the secondary growth that's thickened, that's elongated, that's developed, that's healed, that's uh, uh, improved the transition of taper, and I'm further giving it line, form, design, and, and adding to that continuation of the original concepts. Up next is Treebeard Steve. Going off your remarks just now about a dearth of high quality deciduous broadleaf bonsai, do you think that there is a consensus in North America as to what constitutes a high quality deciduous broadleaf tree? Or is such a consensus still emerging? Uh, that's a really, that's a super solid question. Um, yeah, maybe that's the problem. I think the bigger issue that I understand um, or, or, or that seems, um, to be at the forefront of it for me might not be what is a high quality uh, broadleaf deciduous tree, but how is a high quality broadleaf deciduous tree cultivated? Uh, how, what are the steps? You know, because if, if, if we're taught, and I gotta tell you, you know, I, I tried to learn bonsai before going to Japan too. I know exactly what everybody is up against in the plethora of different opinions, different teachers, uh, regional nuances, and, and sort of, um, uh, you know, misinformation that can be really detrimental towards the expansion of the art, the evolution of the art, uh, your progress in terms of your trees or as an individual bonsai practitioner, right? Like, I've been there. I, I didn't know how to use raffia and nobody could tell me. I didn't know how to use lime sulfur and, and get the deadwood to turn white. I didn't, I didn't know how to clean a live vein. I didn't know the process to uh, broadleaf creation in terms of how do you build it? How do you construct it, right? And so consequently, tree would grow, I would cut it all off, right? Because that's, that's what you do, right? And you wire it out one time and it grows and you cut it back because you, well, I want it to look like I did the first time I styled. No, 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 no. There's a progression. There's a build, right? With the field grown pine, there's a build methodology. With a broadleaf tree, there's a build methodology. And one of the build methodologies is, is when you get that secondary growth, don't cut it all off. Wire it out. Wire it out the first time. Wire out that structure. Push it. Push that structure, right? If you're going to break a Japanese maple branch, break it when it's a raw tree, right? Break it then and let it back bud and, and grow out. Right? Don't break it after you've got a ton of ramification and it's, you know, completely ramrod straight and thick. That's the worst time to try and bend it at that point to get the guts up to do it. Do it at that first moment. You know, we pushed this linden the first time hard, hard, hard. Pushed it real hard. Now I don't have to push it as hard. I'm not going to have tears here that are going to compromise it and make me have to green. That's not where we're at in the, in the design of this tree. And it's because we took that initial step. Now I'm not cutting it all off. Quite the opposite. I'm wiring it all out. This is the build process and the progression that I didn't have that I'm hoping to convey to you. 
All right. Up next is a question from Keegan here in Los Angeles. Is there any reason we can't start the repotting train as soon as the trees drop their leaves? We have a zero danger of temperatures below 30. Yeah, I think um, when you start to talk about just general tree behavior, uh, daylight length as important as temperature, trees drop leaves, are they still functioning? Ah, oh, second time I've done that. Are they still functioning? <laughs> Absolutely, uh, they're still functioning. I think you gotta cross shortest day of the year because that in, in, inherently, that winter uh, solstice is a very important behavioral shift for trees. Just like the summer solstice, the winter solstice important. I think after winter solstice, can you start? Yeah, I do believe so. Is there discussion of fall repotting being something that's positive? Yes. Uh, if we wait until we get into the time where the leaves drop, is that gonna be fruitful? I don't think so. I think you missed the fall repotting window if you were ever gonna fall repot. Again, I don't support necessarily fall repotting unless there's some sort of nuance, like we're dealing with Canamelis japonica and they have a susceptibility to root knot nematode and repotting in the fall on chojubai and, and Japanese quince. Um, makes them less susceptible. Awesome, let's fall repot. But as far as, you know, just sort of a general trend, fall repot, early winter repot, now just wait until you cross that daylight length that changes the general sap content and behavior of the tree. And then I think you're in the wheelhouse. For you where you're at, no worry about freeze. You can definitely start earlier than most places. And in fact, probably want to start earlier than most places. All right, up next is Jib. Are we still applying the process of uh, into the main out towards the sun for the pad formation for this tree, or is a deciduous pad formation more free form? Um, no, you are definitely still into the main out, that acute crotch bud. And let me just, hey Zeus, just, just focus on this for a minute because this is where this all starts. Yeah, bring me in tight here, okay? This is where it all starts. Notice the angle of that bud. The angle of that bud has an acute orientation to that central branch. Notice the one below it, even more acute. Let me rotate it, okay, even more acute. So that's going to elongate, that's going to elongate, oh gosh, here we go. That's gonna elongate along that branch and then it's gonna move out into the light. Elongate along that and then out into the light. Elongate along that and then out into the light. That forms the acute crotch. And now just drop your camera down a little bit, Jesus and just show this natural. Here you go, this is the acute crotch, okay? Untouched as a growth habit right here. Now, if I prune out that central branch, I might get a little bit more of an obtuse crotch right there. That's from pruning. That's not from the natural growth habit. All of these move into the main and then out towards light. This is exactly that process right there. And you notice it drops that off on the inside before moving outside, standard behavior. So we're mimicking that. We are absolutely mimicking that in terms of trying to create the best possible branching formation as we, and that's a great question to be asking when we're talking about secondary, because when we're talking about secondary, we have to maintain the integrity of that growth habit and of that strategy of aesthetic. All right, up next is Foz. Is there anything that you can do to stimulate the callus growth over old wounds other than time? Uh, yes, and we did a whole Foz, we did a whole video on how to do that just for you. I'll drop that link in the chat for you. I believe it's called Deciduous Wound Healing. Yes. Give me one second to find that. Mm, so good. So, 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 so good. You tempting, scrumptious little Linden, you. <laughs> Yummy. 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 Can't find these anymore. Of course, we, uh, we did them on the live stream. The location that we found these pieces, tuned into the live stream, and now we have no, no more Linden material. So there you go, but I'm happy, because uh, to realize the value of these pieces that are being locally grown, these are Pacific Northwest grown. I have no idea who, I have no idea where, uh, but I do know it is a local product. Um, that's being created and that's cool. That's very cool. Okay, now I wanna just bring you into this upper canopy here and specifically this point because you're seeing the apex forming. I mean, it's really progressing, but this is one of the branches that has been a real challenge for me. Now I have a bud on this top side right here and I have this little branch on this bottom side, super straight, very, very thick and tough to bend, very big overly elongated pieces here. There was a question earlier, why wouldn't you cut that back? And we were saying, listen, I wanna build before I cut it back. 
In this instance, am I ever going to be able to empower these interior pieces? And the fact that I have a bud on the top side that's going to carry on, can I go ahead and make this cut now? That's a really big decision to be made. But I think in losing that, and go ahead and zoom out, yeah, I think in losing that side, we enhance the shape of the tree by shortening it. We empower those pieces to have a lot of energy allocated. If we let that, we wire it, we let it grow next year, are we going to get those interior pieces to do more than to produce a leaf over the course of next season? Probably not. And so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to cut back now, even though I have an underdeveloped piece, because I already have too much length and I want to stimulate those pieces to contribute. Right? I have a branch that has a flaw, I have a lack of quality, I have a lack of movement, I have too much girth to change the shape with wire. Great, all of the reasons to cut back, pieces in the right place. Now, I've gotta be super on point when I cut this back because I'm dealing with a very, very, very small bud. Very, very, very small bud right there. Okay, and I'm just gonna go slow, just gonna go slow. Now this is where, okay, I'm cutting towards this very fine branch. How many times have we been cutting towards a very fine branch like that and then we go too far and we cut that branch off? It happens, it happens periodically, okay? Let's not let that happen. This is where you just see me relieving the tension on the branch just slightly and you see me just really, 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 really Really? Okay. All right, let's take a look at how that, that's, that's a worthy change. Okay, that's a worthy change, that's a worthy push in the asymmetrical direction. That was a, a piece that didn't have a lot of quality. I like that move. I like that move a lot. I'm very happy that those buds formed and that we were able to transition. We have it set up. It should take over next year. That further enhances the degree of asymmetry, right? Rocking and rolling. All right, uh, I got a question from Treebeard Steve. Do you plan to compress the branches on the viewer's right over time to increase the tree's asymmetry? Oh, it's almost like we planned it, Treebeard Steve. <laughs> <sighs> the answer is yes. Uh, Ricky wants to know, is linden really soft? I've never worked with it before. Very soft, very soft. Wonderfully soft, in fact. You know, you talk about soft. Sometimes soft has a negative connotation. Uh, it's wonderfully soft, very flexible, um, and inside of that right, gives us a lot of opportunity to change the position of the branching. You talk about more rigid, finer, and, and a lot of times when you talk about bigger, thicker, coarser pieces, they do tend to be a little bit more malleable. I'm trying to think, you know, and don't go to like, don't go to like a jade or a succulent and be like, well, those are thick and coarse and they're super, no, I, un I understand. Just in terms of temperate trees and broadleaf specifically, coarser trees, you talk about a Chinese quince, they can be a, a, a little bit fragile, but ultimately you can reposition their branches a lot. Um, you talk about beech is very, very flexible. Hornbeam is very, very flexible. Stewardia is very, very flexible. Celtus is very, very flexible. Um, but when you get into some of the finer pieces, you get into the smaller and smaller leaves of Japanese maples, they get more and more brittle. Even Japanese maple is very brittle, small leaves, very brittle, right? Trident maple, you know, sort of that moderate level uh, uh, of mobility. Um, when you get into these coarser pieces, it does feel like there's a little more flexibility. I'm sure there's some nuances that would come back and bite me and I would say, ooh, I didn't think about that one. But currently, as I, as I think about it, talking about it being soft, and capable of being styled and the coarseness of it, there, there's some continuity there for sure. All right, it looks like we are all caught up on questions. Caught up on time questions. Being. I am two pieces of wire away from being through the secondary work and it could not, well, let, me just, let me just not do that right now, right? Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's, when, that's when bad things happen when you say, oh man, that worked out so well. <laughs> Are you going to do a, a Halloween costume this year for the Halloween stream, Ryan? I don't know. I don't know. You know? I'll, I'll be wearing one. Oh, you are? Yeah, yeah. behind the mic. <laughs> I'd probably do a Halloween costume. I think we'll do, I think we'll do office Halloween costumes Friday yeah. like next week or yeah. two weeks. Yeah. I feel, like, I feel like Bob Ross needs to make a comeback, but I also feel like Bob's already sort of run his course at Mariah, so maybe there's yeah, another, maybe. In, another inspirational figure. 
if you guys want to submit some ideas to the forum, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll bring some yeah, of the be best curious. ideas to Ryan. I'd be curious. John Muir stands out. John Muir stands out as a potential, mm -hmm. you know, just like pioneer, pioneer of, uh, of the, you know, the spirit of the mountains. I don't know. Cobra Kai skeleton. <laughs> could you, could you co Cobra Kai something? Yeah. I just wanted to say, though, the Cobra Kai sweatshirt, that was never, that was never an intentional contribution to, you know, the, sti the, 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 the style or, or, or there was no, like, passion for Cobra Kai. If they had had a Mr. Miyagi sweatshirt, I would have been all over that. That was definitely a gift. And everywhere I go with that Cobra Kai sweatshirt, people say, dude, that's an awesome sweatshirt. And it's like, I have, I've never seen the, 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 the new series, whatever it is. Uh, I've never seen it. I think it. it's called Cobra Kai. Yeah, it's called Cobra yeah. Kai. That's what I'm saying. Uh, I've never, I haven't seen it. But I, but I do like me some Karate Kid. Um, let's see. Um, somebody suggested that you dress up, dress up as Taft, which I <laughs> like that. <laughs> Brady said that. And then maybe Taft dress up as you. That would be really cute. Oh, my gosh. That would be hilarious. I love that idea. Whoever came up with that is brilliant. It's very cute. You'll have to um, shave in a little uh, lightning bolt into the side of your head. Dang, that's a commitment. That is a commitment <laughs> to the Halloween costume that I might not be willing to make. <laughs> Taft, to, Taft is not, ready to commit. <laughs> I'm gonna, I, well, Taft is, Taft is literally saying next time he wants two or three lightning bolts. So we're You're like, whoa, I got to work on my uh, yeah, head we're, shearing. <laughs> we're, 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 we're locked in. It's a, it's a miracle that we got one lightning bolt in his head, right? So like <laughs> for him to be like, what's up, Danny, dad is like, you. <laughs> I, I, I love you, son, but there's, there's a chance that this could go horribly wrong. If you're willing to roll the dice, I guess. Just tell him that there's a whole bunch on the back of his head that he can't see. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> He'll never know. Yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Okay, last piece here, this junction. Now, I do have some of these areas where I made these big cuts and we have continuation. Little, little stump here. Hey, Zeus, can you see that? Just a little stump that's overlapping. You saw that little bit. I'm going to take that back nice and clean. Okay, nice and clean. I'm not even going to shave that off because when we get this kind of really rapid thickening in an aggressive species like this, uh, to shave it all down, it's going to callus very beautifully in the coarse production of tissue in the apical region here. And I'm just going to give it a touch of callus mate. Now you might say, why give it callus mate? Callus mate causes things to produce more aggressive callus. Yes, and this is already going to produce an aggressive amount of callus. I don't think callus mate is going to make or break the quality of that callus formation. But I actually think that this branch growing here is gonna cause this to thicken to a degree where that's just gonna blend in over a very short period of time. So I'm not worried necessarily about shaving it down and having it be super concise, okay? Nice clean tool, that's enough. That's enough on, on uh, the, the linden when we're talking about pruning some of those smaller stubs that are still left in the upper canopy of the tree. Uh, let's see. Jib says I should dress up as you. You should dress up as me. There you go. That's pretty good. Um, I, I suppose that would be a, a Murai t-shirt and khakis that are a little bit dirty. Um, no, no. You, you have to. What, so, what would be the true commitment? You know, there's a chance that you don't know this as the general Murai community, but I bought like 20 pairs of the same pants because <laughs> over the course of 10 years at Murai, I have not been able to find a pair of pants that last more than three months. And these pants are indestructible, okay? They're from the company KUHL. I'm an, unfortunately embarrassed to say that, yes, it's called cool. They're cool pants. We are endorsing okay? cool pants. I'm endorsing cool <laughs> pants. I never thought I would do this, but I'm gonna tell you, if you are a bone type practitioner, if you're a construction worker, if you are uh, a carpenter, if you're doing anything, that is, you know, people are like, oh, Carhartts, you know, and, or Duluth, and, and no. None of them, none of them held up. Yet these are stretchy, comfortable, and I have yet to throw a pair away. I bought 10 pairs originally, haven't worn a single one of them out yet, re-upped on another 10 pairs 14 months later. I'm set, I'm set for like life, right? So, you know, I don't know about khakis. I would say you gotta, you gotta invest in cool if you're really gonna I guess go, you're if you're right. really gonna go big, Eve. I know, I, I was thinking of your, your summer fit. Your summer fit is the short khakis with the, a, uh, a, a, calf, uh, yeah. a calf high sock, sort of. That's right, that's right, well, you know. Um, I guess if, I guess if, you, wanna, if you wanna be 
truly authentic, you got to pick your season too. Huh? Exactly. Um, I got a question from Nick S. Uh, when talking about a scarless trunk as one ideal in deciduous work, what size branches can you be removing during development in a young tree and be confident that the trunk will appear scarless once the tree approaches refinement? Yeah, that's a really good question. Depends on the species, to be sure, right? Uh, the smoother the bark, when you talk about beech, when you talk about uh, Japanese maple, when you talk about stewardia, when you talk about uh, hornbeam to a large degree, you want to be cutting off branches when they are much thinner than, say, a trident maple, say, a linden, um, a, a Chinese quince, or something of that nature that has a coarser growth habit, more, rascular, more, more rapid vascular productivity. Uh, when you're talking about an elm or some of these big bark trees, doesn't matter because you're gonna be able to use bark to con conceal it. They will heal and bark up over the course of time. But the, the thinner the bark, the smaller the leaf, uh, the, the smoother and finer that tissue, the less that you want it to thicken and the smaller the wound you want it to be as you progressively prune. Okay, so here we are, right? And, and I would say a very, very positive, rapid progression of this tree over, over what, I, what is, in, in bonsai terms for a broadleaf tree, a super duper fast period of time. Initial pruning was spring of last year, initial styling fall of last year, secondary work now, fall of 2021. You went from, it went from being repotted uh, spring of 2019 to now fall of 2021, almost two full years. It'll be two full years, uh, spring of 2020, 2019 to 2020, 2020 to 2021. <clears throat> Yeah, 2021 to 2022, you know, two, two and a half years. We've made huge progression. Now, Josh, can you bring back the original piece from April uh, and just show the original piece prior to work from April? I'm just going to give him a little bit of time. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So this is the original piece prior to any wire being put on here. Uh, and you can see the thinness of the branch. Look at the branch on the lower right. Look at the, the, the notice the, the elongated branch on the lower left branch that's sticking straight up in the middle. That's the one we cut back tonight. Okay, and notice the stump, notice the right angle up at the top. Okay, and then take me to uh, the next piece that you have queued up. Okay, here's the original structural setting. Okay, Josh, just go from this original structural setting to being in the studio now. So that's the primary work right now uh, that you're looking at, and you're going to see the secondary work. Okay, oscillate between those two for me twice. Okay, here's the original. Now, now come to where we are now. Yes, yes. Okay, one more time. Back. Okay, notice the thickening of the branches. Notice the placement, etc. Okay, now bring us back in. Yeah, yeah, massive progress. Massive progress on the canopy, massive progress on the branching proportion, massive progress on the number of branches that are contributing to the overall shape. That, that's the build. That's the deciduous build, and it's happened very, very quickly. At this time of year, we get to experience all of the fruits of the pains and efforts we put in over the course of the growing season in the broadleaf deciduous model because everything is shed, we have an open palette to work with, and it's an opportune time to really be doing this advancement. But again, when you do that initial structure, push it, because then when you come back and do secondary, we don't, we're not free of structural work but it's not nearly as difficult, it's not nearly as risky, the branches are far thicker and more established at that point in time, so we have less malleability. And this is really when we dig into that growth, laying that out and adding that to the branching structure, pruning back things that are overly coarse and we save, and really carrying this tree forward in terms of its evolution as a subject in the bonsai form. All right, I just got one question left from Treebeard Steve. In case someone has asked this yet, what substrate is this tree going in and what is the minimum particle size? Uh, this is solid Akadama and this is 16th to quarter interior uh, that we're utilizing. But let me give you the, 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 full, the full go around here just so that you have all the information you need from the, uh, from the process. But you're watching, notice the, look at the canopy, how we're building out the canopy in that multi-dimensional form, working towards the back, trying to get three-dimensional distribution. Just a consistent, good, solid construction of branching to continue to enhance the design of this tree. Thanks for the support. Good luck. It's time to engage with broadleaves. Hopefully this gets you warmed up and headed on the way. We'll see you for the live Q&A. If not for the live Q&A, we'll see you next week. Talk to you later. Mm -hmm.